Battery bubble, yes or no? Nope. Market by market. <laughs> Generally, no, right? There, there is so much load growth. There's so much that's happening. Generally, no. Uh, ERCOT? I'm, I'm, yes. <laughs> Battery storage is booming in the U.S., and for good reason. So much intermittent renewable energy on the grid demands flexible resources to fill gaps. And short of reverting back to fossil fuels, batteries are the best answer to support the energy transition. Investors have poured billions of dollars into battery storage development to cash in, largely based on speculative opportunities. But there's one problem. Markets have been slow to evolve, leading to an uptick in consolidation and growing uncertainty about the path ahead. A battery bubble may be forming. What happens if it pops? I'm John Ingle, Editor-in-Chief of Renewable Energy World. This week on Factor This, we aim to answer that question with the help of Cody Hill and Renee Steichen from Rev Renewables and Jason Berwin from Gridstore by taking an intimate look at the two top battery markets in the country, California and Texas, and their diverging trajectories. That's all next on Factor This from Renewable Energy World. God, I sound terrible. I have not talked all day. This is this is going to be interesting. Problem of working see how much uh, yeah, so, see how much I can do in post. Special <laughs> RSV edition. Bad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is brought to you by RSV and all other viral infections that you might be dealing with. Just at feed home. the transcript to an AI. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It'll this, narrate it I'm, for you. I'm gonna replace I'm gonna outsource my own job yeah. to AI. Renee, Cody, and Jason, thanks for joining the Fact of This podcast. Nice to see you guys. Thanks. Nice to see you. Thanks for having us. Great to be here. We are staffed all over the world right now. Jason, you are in Australia. Cody and Renee, you're both in California, correct? Right. Yep. And I'm in the mountains of North Carolina. So I think we're very geographically um, uh, diverse here. So I'm, I'm looking forward to this conversation. And as the title will likely suggest which I haven't written yet, but I'm assuming I'm going to put something in there about battery storage bubble bursting or could that happen or is that on the way? Because I need the click and I need to get them in the door. So that's the primer. And we're going to talk a little bit more about how this stage is being set and what might be happening in the market in just a little bit. This will build off of a previous conversation I've had on this podcast as well. Episode 50 with the now former CEO of Key Capture Energy, Jeff Bishop, broke down the um, energy storage markets, how they're structured. And so we're going to use that as a prerequisite set of content to build off and take a, a, a greater outlook into how how the market is shifting and what's going on. So with all that being said, I do want each of you to take a, a quick minute to introduce yourselves and your, your background and, and your roles today so that we can um, help the audience follow along with your perspectives. Uh, Jason, can you start us off? Sure. So I'm Jason Berwin. I'm the vice president of policy and strategy for Gridstore. Gridstore is a independent power producer and developer of large scale standalone battery energy storage systems. And uh, my background that I bring to this work is that I started working with the industry back in 2015 when there are about 300 megawatts of batteries entire in the entire American power system. Uh, representing the industry as the head of policy for the National Trade Association, then the Energy Storage Association, eventually leading that organization and then merging it and leading the energy storage function at the American Clean Power Association. Awesome. Cody, how about you? Uh, yeah, hi. I, uh, I'm Cody Hill. I lead the battery storage business unit at uh, Rev Renewables. Um, I'm a power systems engineer by background and have been doing... Um, battery storage related things professionally since 2010. Uh, you know, originally at a, a technology company, you know, integrator, um, doing all sorts of different things at that, uh, that startup. Um, for the last almost 10 years now, I've been on the development side, uh, joined LS Power in 2014, and um, we spun Rev Renewables out of LS in 2021? One. 2021, yeah. So been, do- been doing it a long time. 
I wonder how often that's going to happen in this conversation where Renee then comes in and, and qualifies something Cody says or clarifies. Maybe <laughs> or vice that'll versa. Be part of yeah. Renee's background. <laughs> yeah, or vice versa. And I will say, Cody, also a top tier energy Twitter follow. So I, I hope you bring the the sharpness of your tweets or, or zeets or whatever we're calling them to this this podcast discussion. I don't want you to hold back at all. Is, is that sure. a fair stage setter yeah. here? OK. All right, Renee, can you round us out? Sure. So Renee Steichen, uh, also with Rev Renewables, and I lead our regulatory affairs policy work here at Rev. Um, and I have my background is in sustainability and energy policy kind of throughout my career, working in government, consulting uh, at a startup, at a utility. And uh, for the last three plus years, I've been at Rev Renewables, uh, also started at LS Power. And so it was part of the the Rev spin out um, and now currently leading our um, ISO, RTO, markets policy and, and California policy work. Um, and then also working with our industry associations, um, including uh, our California Energy Storage Alliance and I'm vice chair of the board. Although disclaimer, anything I say is my own views, not Rev or anyone else's. Anyone else have a disclaimer <laughs> we need to get out there? Well, I was going to say maybe Renee is being a little too modest, but Renee, aren't you the incoming board chair? Incoming board chair. Yes. Next year will be the chair. That's yeah. pretty impressive. Yeah. You don't want to bury the lead there. <laughs> nice job, Jason. This is we're off to a great start. And we have the balance here is two policy wonks and an engineer, which I think is probably the appropriate ratio. Because if it, <laughs> if it was flipped, we're having an entirely different conversation. Would you agree? Oh, yeah. I'm I'm severely outnumbered here on, on the policy expertise. So. <laughs> <laughs> that was a natural moment between earlier when two I wonks. Yeah, <laughs> when I just let Renee yeah, solve between, with the right answer. <laughs> between two wonks, I might not have to use that one. That That'll might be, boot out yeah. the uh, battery bubble mm, popping. Like yeah. Um, yeah. So to get back to that point, this the idea for this podcast episode began, as many of them do, as half baked ideas or rumblings that I'm hearing uh, within the industry. And and you are starting to to. Uh, the, the buzz around the battery bubble and what's happening with potentially, you know, oversaturation in ERCOT, now the second largest battery storage market in the U.S., more M&A activity with assets that are on the ground and trying to read the tea leaves on what this means for the broader industry is, is something that's challenging for me to do and why I think I first pinged you, Jason, about this. We were brainstorming a, a way to have a conversation here, um, but can Jason, can you set the stage a little bit on the the current outlook for the battery storage market? We know it's booming. There's been tons of growth in recent years, but now it appears there's some kind of a crossroad shaping up and I, I can't quite put my finger on it. Yeah, I'd be happy to. In my perspective here is that, you know, it, it helps to have a little bit of history here, right? Just to remember where we've come from in 2000, or in, sorry, 2020, we across the entire United States installed one gigawatt of energy storage in the United States. This year, 2023, the expectation is that we're going to just get very close to 10 gigawatts installed in one year. We are at an extraordinarily rapid acceleration in the deployment of energy storage in the United States. And there are a couple of reasons for that. One is because, of course, there have been many pioneers like Cody and others who have been doing the hard work of figuring out how to install and operate battery storage systems on the power grid profitably and worked out a lot of the engineering kinks and market design kinks and financing kinks to be able to do that in a fairly confident way. We've seen a, an enormous amount of cost declines in batteries, which has, of course, made a lot of this economic and possible. We have seen the development in the policy space of a foundation in which battery storage can operate, whether that's things like market rules in RTOs and ISOs being modified to actually mainstream battery storage operations, such as FERC Order 841 was intended to accomplish and that the RTOs and ISOs have implemented in varying levels, um, or things like, for example, storage deployment targets in the states. And of course, it wouldn't 
it would be remiss to not mention the Inflation Reduction Act and the investment tax credit it now gives directly to battery storage projects that are not necessarily tied to solar projects, which is, of course, how it was required to uh, be installed in order to avail the investment tax credit up until the IRA was enacted. All of those sort of foundations have been set, and there's an enormous market opportunity that many companies, both mine and Cody's and Renee's, are now chasing. And I think we are experiencing the good problems to have, right? Good problems that are no longer, should we build storage? Is there demand for storage? But how much and how fast is, I think, much more the questions a lot of folks are facing. And and to get to your original question, I think that this question of, for example, uh, are we now outstripping expectations? I don't know that that's actually how I would frame it, because fundamentally, the nature of project development is fundamentally uncertain. You are making educated guesses about where conditions will develop, especially because the development timelines here can be sometimes several years. And you are doing what you can as a developer to try and build projects in the right place at the right time to be able to profit from doing that, right? So I think that a degree of uh, whatever word you want to use for it, speculation, is necessarily part of the game when it comes to development. Of course, these large interconnection queues of storage are not all going to get built. No one expects that to happen. But I do think this question of are we outstripping the actual sort of, uh, for lack of a better word, economic opportunity here with the amount of development interest is an interesting question because it depends on who you talk to and where you're going. And I'm sure that that's what this conversation will be about. I'm going to bleep out where you you kindly uh, and softly disagree with the characterization and then I'll I'll paste in some some dubbing or something. There we go. Make me agree. Make me agree harder. I'll do it. And AI can probably help there. Renee, can you help explain to as as we just establish another layer for the foundation here on why policy frameworks for storage are so important and how those look as as they currently stand with California obviously being the the leading market and I talked about Texas being you know right behind and and um, growing quickly but w- why are why is it so important for us to focus on this and be talking about these structures to facilitate that development and deployment? Yeah, I think, you know, as Jason pointed out, policy is kind of a critical part of this. And, you know, in California, we really saw this play out um, in the early, you know, in, I guess, California had the first energy storage mandate of, uh, I believe it was 1.2 gigawatts. And that started the ball rolling in California. But it wasn't really until, you know, the, the summer 2020 blackouts that happened that, California really kind of got serious about um, deploying energy storage. And there was a handful of projects in the queue. And, you know, Rev had our we had our first project in 2018 and uh, coincidentally, our first uh, large scale project of 250 megawatts that came on kind of right. I think it was like the week before the blackouts happened. And uh, Kaiso was very happy about that. Um, But there was a, a lack of a market signal to really incentivize new projects to come online until the California Public Utility Commission started issuing procurement orders. Um, I guess they did the first one in 2019 with 3.3 gigawatts. And and then shortly afterwards, after the blackouts, they had emergency procurement orders and um, a 2021 order for 11.5 gigawatts. And since California has a ban on any new natural gas generation, you know, storage was really the only thing with the qualifying capacity to help fill that gap. You know, solar isn't going to get you there. Uh, even wind, there's not a lot of opportunities, new opportunities in California. So that really opened the door for storage to come online in California and help set the, the groundwork for that. Um, in other regions, you know, we just haven't seen, I think we're starting to see some of that, um, those policy mandates. You know, Maryland just passed a, a three gigawatt procurement order this year. Um, Michigan just passed a, a procurement mandate. You know, New York and Illinois are working on one. So in areas where the market fundamentals don't otherwise work today, um, those policy mandates and programs 
can help bridge that gap. To that point, does it only really work in California right now? Is that the only real market for battery storage? Are there other attractive opportunities beyond California um, based on the learnings that, you know, California has already gone through? I saw Jason shake his head, so I, you, you got to gotta reply there. Storage is also going to work in Texas. Let's be very clear. I mean, that is the second largest market behind California and probably faster growing uh, at this point and just the straight megawatt capacity. Although obviously caveat, these are one and two hour duration at rated capacity projects. Well, so then help me understand Texas and maybe Cody was going to get to that, but it's my understanding that a a lot of development shops are um, structured around the opportunity in ERCOT while that program is still relatively small and focused on ancillary services, not resource adequacy or, you know, the the more mature market of California. And as that program becomes, you know, fully, uh, whatever the terminology is, fully subscribed or, um, I don't know, tapped out of capacity, where does it go from there without the political will to, um, you know, push expansion of, of, energy storage policy. So, so there, there's a lot there. And um, like, let, let's come back to a lot of the specifics on what happens in, in ERCOT, because I think there's still some more like groundwork to be laid here, right? Um, t- totally agree with uh, how Renee and, and Jason characterized it. And it, it's, it's worth saying that like nowhere really needs storage in general. There, there are places that benefit from storage projects, all right? And it's how you use it, and it's who is the customer. Uh, you know, is, is it a reliability benefit? Is it an economic play where you're going after some, you know, really high-priced opportunity that you only need to exist for two or three years? You know, like there there is a, a whole lot of variability in what storage developers, you know, are doing and have been doing. Uh, but in general, the end customers, you know, load uh, as represented by the the load serving entities, usually utilities, but uh, you know sometimes independent players, especially in Texas, and um, increasingly represented by uh, you know community choice aggregators in California, plus a little bit of, of independent um, players as well that are that are doing direct access. Uh, those buyers, they all have unique needs and. and what they have in common is they have uh, reliability needs, right? They have to keep the lights on. L- like Renee said, in 2020, that's what really focused and got all the storage built in California. There, there was a mandate that had been there for you know nearly a decade, and there had been some procurement against it, but really nothing had been brought online because it wasn't urgent, right? So the utilities were doing the minimum required procurement year by year to just be in line with law and, and regulatory requirements, but th- they weren't interested in getting storage built. That was really just, you know, something they had to go do to a certain minimum amount, but they really got focused and got in gear and really the entire state did when there was a two hour blackout in August of 2020. I would say that that's partly true, but I also think that, and I, I would love to have this conversation, Cody, because I feel like we've glanced at this before in previous conversations about what was the actual impact of the California AB 2514 storage mandate, right? 1.325 gigawatts by 2020. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that the Aliso Canyon gas storage facility failure, which was effectively addressed with a whole bunch of really fast battery storage deployments, was only possible because the state had said, we're going to go this direction and had done a lot of the regulatory groundwork, had gotten bids in so that people were effectively ready to respond fairly fast to a sudden and urgent need. Now, those were not 100 megawatt projects. Those were tens and 20s. But at in 2016, 10s and 20s were pretty big. And so I think that California was successful and able to handle that situation because of the work it did. And that also gave the entire regulatory apparatus in California a lot more confidence that batteries would be there for reliability in the clean energy transition in California, such that now battery storage is truly the backbone of the integrated resource plan in California's clean energy transition. I don't think that you see as much confidence in that if you don't have that kind of earlier work and and proof point. Yeah, yeah I, I think there's a lot that's true about that. Aliso Canyon was a huge moment for the industry, but also I think 
massively overstated in terms of its real impact, like to the power grid as a whole by the industry, right? So uh, for those who don't recall, Aliso Canyon was a gas leak. There's this big underground cavern that stores tons of natural gas for Southern California, and it started leaking you know, really bad in kind of the middle of the last decade. And when they found it, they had to derate a bunch of the natural gas power plants that were in the area. And there was something like a 10 gigawatt potential shortfall of, of generation in, in and around the LA basin. Uh, absolutely an, an emergency for the people responsible for, you know, maintaining California's infrastructure. They did go out and, uh, you know, on an accelerated basis, procure as much so-called, you know, shovel ready battery storage as there was around that time, which you're right, Jason was, you know, 20 megawatts here and 20 megawatts there. I think in total, it added up to about a hundred megawatts. So, you know, was a hundred megawatts going to keep the lights on for a 10 gigawatt shortfall? Absolutely not. It was, it was <laughs> a fraction of 1% of what, what you actually needed. Um, but was it a really pivotal moment for the battery storage industry, which was so nascent? And to your point, you know, there was a thousand megawatts online by 2020. Back then it was, it, it was a few hundred megawatts in the entire, in the entire country. And almost all of that was in PJM strictly doing ancillary services in response to FERC 755, plus a few dozen megawatts in Hawaii that were there for uh, Hawaii's own very u- unique needs that, that made it a, a market back, you know, following the Recovery Act in 2010 or so. But so, so huge moment, did build a lot of confidence, um, did not meaningfully add much capacity to the grid. Uh, I, I, I do think that, um, you know, still we didn't actually see battery storage doing the thing that, um, uh, that everyone wanted to see it do, which was shifting energy, you know, from the, the solar hours to the evening peak hours, displacing natural gas generation. We never actually saw that happen really until like 2021, which is just a couple of years ago. But once that started happening, everyone was like, okay, yeah, no, we can totally go big on this. We, we can run California almost entirely off solar and batteries on a spring day. Like the, the technical confidence is now there. Um, and the question is just how do you maintain reliability, you know, not on the average spring day, right? On your most extreme, um, you know, summer heat wave day or um, not so much in California, but in the rest of the country, what do you do during winter storms? And and what storage is going to do in each of those places is going to be wildly different. I was just going to add that, you know, I think those early projects also, you know, you could think about them in the pilot sense and, you know, every utility and ISO RTO around the country, you know, it, even if it's not a new technology period, you know, it's always, if it's new to them, they need to kind of um, kick the tires a bit and see how it works and make sure that it's not going to mess up in their market models and that it's not going to disrupt their grid. And so I think those early projects were also very important for that as well. Well, that's a good point, Renee, because I hear from utilities all the time that no one wants to be the first mover. No one wants to be the first to try anything. While pilots here and there do make for great press releases and show that, you know, we're innovating and we're we're at the, the you know, cutting edge of, of technology or whatever. No one wants to mess up because they can't afford to mess up and they don't have those, you know, mulligans in hand to, to, to test things out. But at the same time, if California has already proven out the the case for batteries and has um, overcome those technical challenges that Cody was mentioning, why haven't other markets evolved as as quickly? You know, I was going to just point out one thing that California has that nowhere else has is the the duck curve with the solar. You know, I guess Texas has this a bit as well. And, you know, being able to have that energy arbitrage and shift, you know, charge at low prices and discharge later in the day at higher prices, um, you know, is key for the economics of battery storage. And, you know, even RA prices, resource adequacy prices in California are critical for uh, the, for the battery storage, you know, fundamentals. But having that uh, market economic opportunity as well is really what makes the California market work. And that energy arbitrage opportunity is just not there in pretty much any other market except a bit in Cal- in Texas, which is why there are only one or two hours there. Yeah. So just to, to expand on that, right? Uh, California, like we said, it, it clearly is a market that works now. And if you look at what it has that makes it work now, um, 
there, there's a couple of major things, and then there's also some nice to haves that um, that are generally pretty good. The, the major things, it, it you know, they have a need for dispatchable capacity, and they also have a rule that you can't build natural gas generation or really anything with a smokestack. It, it's not written that plainly, but ask any developer, you can't build anything with a smokestack in California. So when they say we need gigawatts of dispatchable capacity. By default, that has to be battery storage, given the current technology options available to us developers. Uh, so that means there is, uh, you know, a, a big group of buyers that are out and they're trying to procure. They're trying to meet both their procurement mandates and their basic reliability metrics. And, and so they're out purchasing resource adequacy, which is the, the California capacity construct. Uh, other markets may or may not have a capacity market and it may or may not be structured in such a way that uh, you know provides much certainty at all to to an incoming battery storage asset so that's better in california than, than elsewhere f for energy storage specifically uh, but then the, what the duck curve that renee mentioned drives is you know there's lots of excess energy in the middle of the day which results in extremely low prices and your price to charge is, is one critical part of it for a battery and the price at which you can discharge is the other. And when the sun goes down, you go to California's kind of most expensive, uh, worst heat rate, natural gas facilities being on the margin, uh, plus their carbon price adders, you know, that being what sets your discharge price is, is really key. So you need a low charge price, a high discharge price, ideally a capacity construct. And then ancillary services are a nice to have. So ancillary services like frequency regulation, uh, they do, you know, generate a lot of revenue for, for battery storage, particularly the first movers in any given market, uh, because it is a, a premium product, but it's a very, very shallow market. You don't need very much of it. You only need a few hundred megawatts for a very large market like like California or Texas or PJM. And so it, it tends to saturate very, very quickly. But the people who get in early do, do really well with it. So it's one of these things where it, it helps you kind of get started in, in the energy storage um, universe, but it's not going to scale to, to gigawatts, right? It, it's going to be a handful of pilot projects, maybe a few hundred megawatts. Um, so yeah, that's uh, th that's really the thing to focus on. And then when you go and look with that framework at other markets, you can say, okay, what does ERCOT have going for it? Um, does not have a capacity market. Um, has generally pretty cheap prices, but also has a lot of air conditioning load. It's a very hot place. Uh, doesn't have that much solar yet that there's excess generation. So you can't really charge very cheaply in Texas, right? It, and then you look at the discharge price, and that's really the entire story if you have um, you know, not bet everything on ancillary services, the discharge price has to be what's carrying the kind of lack of those, those other forces for you in ERCOT. And, and what is your discharge price going to be uh, on a normal day? It's going to be your fossil fuel assets, which in Texas are, are also pretty easy to build, are, are newer and more efficient than, uh, than they're going to be in a lot of other places. It's, it's very easy to build just about anything in Texas. And you've got um, lots of natural gas resources nearby. So you're not going to have a, you know, a natural gas basis to Henry Hub. You're going to have you know, low cost fuel going into efficient plants. You're not going to have high prices on a normal day in ERCOT. What you are going to have, which is special to Texas, is these extremely high price scarcity events. And, and so to me, when you look at why are people going into ERCOT? Either they really believe this ancillary service, you know, view of the world that there's going to be just so much revenue in there that it's going to make it make sense for the next 20 years, or you mostly are betting on the existence of tons of scarcity prices going forward. Um, all valid things, and, and Texas load growth is incredible. So all of the things that I think Jeff Bishop mentioned previously, you know, there's a lot of merit to a lot of it. There is a very valid bull case to be made in ERCOT. Uh, but it, it's going to be a boomy, busty kind of market. There, there's just it's so much low barriers to entry, and, and it's so easy to get in there to to build lots of stuff. And so many people raised so much money to go build so much stuff in the last few years that you know it, it's uh, it, it's it's not for the faint of heart. It's it's a very tough market. Yeah, I mean. <clears throat> I think that, first of all, as an aside, John, if you wanted an alternative framing here, the Texas versus California, both have storage, very different markets. What's the story, right? That I think could be. I'm not going to go with the don't California, my Texas battery storage market, oh, or, okay. you know, whatever you're trying to lead. Don't don't mess with Texas batteries, you know, whatever <laughs> it is. I lived I lived in Texas and covered politics for TV news. You don't think I have all those cliches just waiting <laughs> on my hip? 
in that holster ready Indeed. to fire because I do. Well, I do have them. But I mean, the truth of the matter is, right? Like, this is what makes it interesting is that you have California, which is truly policy led. You have Texas, which I would say is not policy led at the very least, if anti policy led for storage. And yet, you have massive storage growth in both markets, right? So that's interesting because typically we'd think, oh, there's one route here. No, there are multiple routes here. And why people are showing showing up in Texas, I think Cody obviously has gotten to a bunch of it. Uh, I would say that a boom bust uh, dynamic is kind of the nature of the Texas market and always has been. Been if you have low barriers to entry. Yeah, it's not a storage thing, right? It's, a, <laughs> it's the whole industry thing, the whole power industry. Right. Yeah. yeah. And so, and I think the question just becomes there like, one, as we all know, just because there's a bust does not mean these assets disappear. They oftentimes change hands. But I don't know that that's necessarily a reason not to go into the market. I think that there's a lot of folks who see the ability to navigate around some of that, perhaps based on really, really uh, interesting citing theses. Um, certainly, I also think that, well, yeah, saturation of ancillaries is something that will happen as you get a lot more storage in. Um, there is something, there are a couple of things that are happening in Texas. One that Cody mentioned, which is bonkers load growth, like bonkers load growth. And when you have that much load growth, that kind of creates a rising tide for everyone on the supply side. I think that's actually a dynamic we're not talking about in the United States as a whole period, and we can get to. But another thing that's also happening in Texas is that uh, it is a wind heavy market, right? And when prices spike is usually having to do with a miss on the forecast of wind. And those larger forecast errors, I think, are really significant for why you would want to have energy storage in that market. The ramps, you know, it's not a duck curve yet, but you're seeing significant like multi gigawatt ramps uh, in the market. And so managing those ramps is also, again, something that storage can do on a very granular basis, which ostensibly an energy only market design should be good for. Uh, and then let's not forget solar is coming, man. I think I saw something like 14 or 15 gigs of solar have CODs planned for 2024. Like the duck may not be there now, but oh boy, I think Texas is going to get very, very interesting. And I won't disagree that a ton of people are chasing that opportunity. I'm just not sure that the net net is that people will lose their shirts on this. I think just the opposite that particularly that bouncing load growth means that I think there's going to be a pretty healthy opportunity for some time. But just to play devil's advocate really quickly, and, and the other point on wind, stranded wind in southeast uh, Texas with transmission constraints is a real opportunity down the line too. But don't you have to have the the uh, the will of policymakers behind batteries are the answer and can play an important role here that if if they don't go in that direction and it continues to just be an ancillary services opportunity, is there enough meat on the bone, given how much investment has already been made in this space and, and the number of platforms raising hundreds of millions of dollars to, to take on ERCOT or, or the California market or whatever uh, is growing? Um, you're, you're making quite the, the speculation by saying, look at all these opportunities that should be there. But if the framework isn't put in place, it really doesn't matter if batteries could do all those things. Right. Like you can't just make batteries be the answer if the regulatory uh, powers that be don't want them to be the answer and they would rather subsidize new gas gen for eight billion dollars. Well, so so I guess here's the thing, right? Like, yeah, obviously, there's a lot of political rhetoric in a place like Texas that's at this point sort of rhetorically anti renewables. The political outcomes we've seen to date are not like. They're not some sort of dagger in the heart of clean energy. Like, sure, give concessional loans to thermal generators. That's fine. I'm not too worried about that. I don't think that, frankly, a lot of people in the thermal gen business think that's like a really huge part of their economic future, to be honest. Um, this performance credit mechanism, like... Good luck getting this done now that the legislature has decided to tie the hands of ERCOT from 
implementing it and putting a giant, a very stringent price cap on it. Like it's, I guess what I would say is that the commitment to the market design, while obviously there is now uncertainty in Texas, and that is policy uncertainty is, I think, newer in Texas. Um, right now, I think what we've seen is just the opposite, that industrial customers who value cheap energy are the dominant political force, not anti-renewables ideological zealots. And that's going to create a strong ballast, I think, for Texas's energy po- politics. But Cody, maybe you see a different view there. No, I, I agree with everything you said. And actually, it's it's interesting. I think we're I almost hear you giving too much credit, John, to to the California policy side. I, I don't think policy is actually that. I'm important. just trying to ring the towel. Yeah, you're no, right. I mean, that's what I'm so, doing, Cody. I, this is a it's a podcaster host yeah. tool. Oh, I'm man. just no, no, so I'm trying to get me. you there. So, so let's get into this a little bit. So California <laughs> has great fundamentals, <laughs> economic fundamentals, and and the policy that it has. You know, it, it had this this useful history of policy to get things started, right? It got some things into the market. So we knew that it worked and, and proved that it was a valid tool. But the fact that we didn't just build, you know, 1.3 gigawatts of, of storage, but rather like zoomed through that to six or whatever it is today. Um, you know, that's not based on storage mandates. Like all of those procurement mandates were just go buy dispatchable capacity. So, so just, just by saying, Hey, you have to go buy enough capacity for all the load in California. And you can't do it with any new gas. Uh, you know, that got the storage built alone. So it's, it's not that it was storage focused policy in California that they got things to where they are today. Um, it provided that initial spark that got the market moving. But, you know, everything that's happened in the last three years is, is just, you know, in, in general, a, a need to keep the lights on in the most cost effective way with tools that do not include anything with a smokestack, as I was saying before. Uh, However, the really interesting thing, and here's where California and Texas are more alike than different, is California is also keeping the lights on with a whole bunch of natural gas generation that it is never, ever going to let retire, uh, <laughs> like barring some miracle of, you know, huge amounts of uh, other stuff getting built. You know, you need some other dispatchable thing because they are not there's no amount of batteries that you can build that lets you co- close tens of gigawatts of, of natural gas in California permanently. Um, you can get that gas down to, you know, 1% capacity factors only needed a few days a year. Um, but you still got to keep it around because blackouts are just not politically tenable. Um, ERCOT's whole reason, or it's not ERCOT, it's the state of Texas. The, the reason the state of Texas is trying to fund these additional nas- natural gas generators in the state is because they found that out. They, they, they rode too close to the line. They had major blackouts. People died. And that's just not acceptable in a modern economy. And so what you have is really the mirror image of what California is doing, keeping all of its uh, its coastal gas plants online. Texas is building a bunch of new ones to keep pace with load growth and, and to keep the lights on. And there's probably plenty of room for storage outside of that reliability function that, that is being you know currently placed on the natural gas system. But I mean, you've got a lot of runway for the next decade plus before you need to worry about, um, you know, competing with natural gas on, uh, on a lot of these things. Renee, any thoughts here? Yeah. You know, I was just going to add that even when California wants to retire things, you know, these once they're cooling plants that have been set to retire for, you know, I think the last 10 years or so, and we keep delaying it. And now they're extended for even longer, sitting in the strategic reliability reserve. And, you know, it's it's a big concern. Like as load is growing, as we talked about, you know, nobody wants to be in charge when the lights go out. And so they're keeping all of these things around as long as possible. Storage is certainly helping fill that gap and helping them feel more comfortable in, in California that they can retire those. Um, but I think they're going to need to see a lot more come online in order for that to actually happen. So then where are we going? You, we've talked about load growth now a couple of times. So let's get to that, Jason. You talked about that right in the setup. Um, seeing a lot of load growth, especially in the Southeast with the industrials uh, coming online. And I think um, Southern Company and Duke have put out some interesting figures on their, you know, the adjustments to their five and 10 year forecasts are substantial. And, um, it, you know, it's got to come from somewhere. So is that is that another emerging battery opportunity? And do we see the willingness to, you know, support uh, battery deployment in the southeast? You're talking to IPPs. I'm not sure if we can talk about the southeast <laughs> with any degree of sophistication. 
Yeah, that's well, you could they want to own all their projects. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're gonna have to find a different group of guests, I think, to talk about uh, what, what but, to do in southern companies. Territory. You keep bringing up load growth, so where's all the load okay. growth? Okay, it's in the well, southeast. There's load growth in more than just the southeast. I mean, Texas obviously has yeah. a significant amount of it, but we're also seeing so load SPP. growth in large. Yeah, SPP, MISO, the entire like middle of the country, we're seeing lots of plans for whether that's new manufacturing, whether that's data centers, whether that's other things that are going to be driving very significant demands on the bulk power system. And I don't think that like it's starting to break through that there's a realization like, oh, we need a lot of stuff soon, but I feel like it still is kind of in whispers around the edges. And when you go to places like Northern Virginia, you see how incredibly quickly you can oversubscribe the transmission infrastructure of a place with new load. And that is going to be something that I think one, storage can obviously play a part in being a solution for, but two, that environment of you know, very significant load growth and a straining supply of infrastructure or, you know, uh, capacity in the power gen power supply side is going to be its own political dynamic and its own market dynamic that is going to change how we think about a lot of this. And I'll just add, you know, some stories in, in PJM, as uh, Jason was pointing out with Northern Virginia, there's also huge transmission constraints and major retirements that are going on there, um, like fossil generation retirements that are, you know, whether you consider them economic or policy, I think they're they're both happening. But PJM has been kind of increasingly raising the alarm that we need to, uh, I guess, retire, uh, retire smartly <laughs> and and wanting to delay some of these planned retirements. I know there's Brandon Shores in Maryland is a, is a really big one right now. And they're concerned about reliability um, because the transmission upgrades are are not happening um, for several years yet. And so needing to keep these um, these big plants online because the new plant generation, I mean, working your way through the interconnection queue is still taking many years, even though they have a plan and they're executing on trying to get these uh, generation units through the queue. And it's mostly solar, wind, and batteries in the PJM queue right now. You know, there's a couple of gas plants in there, but I think this is where the a market like PJM is going to have to see some changes in order to actually get the battery capacity on. You know, I see something like in California where um, batteries are essentially the only thing with the capacity factor to, you know, get close to replacing any sort of fossil generation. Um, but the market dynamics there are very different given they have a centralized multi-state capacity market and it is forward looking, but, you know, it's, as we've seen in the last 10 years, it swings quite wildly in terms of prices. Whereas, you know, in California, you can lock in a price for 10 years Whereas in PJM, it could fluctuate pretty drastically from year to year. You know, hopefully some of the changes are going to stabilize that a bit more and, and provide a better outlook for that. Um, and that might help move the needle on on battery economics in a market like PJM. Yeah. And one of the interesting things, I, I think you can always kind of look at what got conventional power plants built before battery storage to, to understand a given market. And, and PJM you know, during the last decade, built something like 20 gigawatts of, you know, combined cycle gas plants at around the same time that, you know, battery storage was in its first boom and we built like two or 300 megawatts of, of, of battery storage. So kind of, again, the scale of these, these relative industries is interesting, but uh, a lot of those plants got built on the back of, you know, that same three-year capacity auction that, that Renee was just describing, um, which does not provide, you know, all that much certainty and, and none after it's, you know, look, looking forward window goes. But, um, but a big part of it was that people were able to do these energy hedges. They were, they were able to find different constructs, you know, with financial counterparties to put some sort of a revenue floor in place. And so, People were looking at kind of what was the price at which they were going to be able to sell power on these long strips, you know, these 12 plus hour strips of, of energy. And they were able to say, okay, I'm going to make at least this much energy 
revenue. Um, I can lock that in with a financial counterparty. I can finance my billion dollar gas plan on the back of that. Um, so you would expect in a lot of these places, something similar is going to be a big part of it for battery storage. Uh, you know, our, our group did the first one of those with a battery plant selling a four hour strip of energy and buying a five hour strip and locking that price in over the course of five years. Um, when, when we built, um, some of our, you know, 2020 era for first projects, um, that is a very viable way to do things, uh, but you need a price signal to, to make that happen. And, and a lot of these places, again, don't have the solar online yet. There's tons in the queue, so they don't really have the low prices in the day. Um, their high prices in the evening are not peaky like California's. And, and this is kind of a fascinating thing where weather really sets, you know, your, um, sets your destiny in the, in the power business. Uh, you know, in California, when the sun goes down, it almost immediately starts to cool off and air conditioners turn back off. And the most extreme days are all air conditioning driven days in California. So that's why that four hour resource adequacy construct that's gotten lots of, you know, two, three, four hour batteries built uh, is actually a perfect fit because that's really all you need because by 10 p.m., it's cool again and you don't need that much extra generation. You can uh, recharge overnight or wait, you know, to wait till the morning. Uh, but you go into these northeastern markets, especially, you know, large parts of PJM, ISO New England, New York, uh, ERCOT on a bad year, right? Th these places have cold winters that they're actually really solving for. And those those cold snaps do not end after two to four hours. They, they can last for, you know, eight and 12 hours and they can last for days. So when you look at what the PJM capacity market solves for, um, you know, the 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 capacity performance requirements are really geared for these much longer events, you know, m more like the winter storm that happened, uh, you know, two Christmases ago, that, that type of uh, thing are what, what you're solving for. And so it's not as easy a fit for battery storage at its cost point today. That's where you need to see the costs come down on batteries because some of these places don't need a four hour battery and probably never will. They need an eight or a 12 hour battery. Um, if you're solving for, you know, capacity needs, um, There'll, there'll be shorter duration opportunities in, you know, ancillary services and, and maybe some energy niche type type stuff, reliability type services. Uh, but yeah, that's that, that's really the dynamic. I was just going to add on to with PJM, you know, an interesting thing about their capacity market is they have a, a performance um, assessment structure um, or a penalty and bonus structure, if you want to think about it that way, um, where you know, if you are there and you're generating, then that's good. But if you don't, then you get major penalties. And that's what we saw, you know, last year with Winter Storm Elliott, there was, um, you know, over a billion dollars in penalties assessed to generating units. And that's difficult for a four hour duration unit. You could perform admirably just as expected for those four hours. But if the, if the duration of the event is longer than that, then you are subject to penalties and having a structure like that um, is going to be a challenge for uh, shorter duration battery storage. I would add to all of this that, first of all, <laughs> what Cody said about sort of winter, winter is coming. I don't know how I can do the Game of Thrones voice, but like the the nature of winter reliability events and particularly the fact that my understanding is that we will expect over the longer term to see summer peaking systems turn into winter peaking systems, partly due to the electrification of heating loads and just the nature of, uh, I guess, how those markets are developing presents some real significant challenges when it comes to the contribution of current day technologies to resource adequacy for all the reasons Cody has mentioned. I do think part of that can be ameliorated by longer durations. That's why we have capacity accreditation in things like the PJM market and the, you know, PJM's own engineers basically saying like, yeah, when you get up to eight or 10 hours uh, with a battery, you're at nearly, you know, a uh, full credit, so to speak, like based on the way they dispatch and model their system, that should provide them the needed reliability they see for the years in the, you know, not too distant future. The that will change over time. We would expect it to be dynamic. But I think that the question is not, can we meet eight, 10, 12 hour uh, gaps? Because I think 
we will see that happen and probably with and we there are eight hour lithium ion battery systems out there already i think ella aren't you guys building one isn't rev i can't <laughs> yeah. remember anyway yeah we were the first uh long duration eight hour battery project in california our yeah, first contact see? be online there you go yeah. and <laughs> see <laughs> exactly we'll have tens and twelves too i think the difference comes when you get to these multi-day type events that's really that's a different technology suite, uh, you know, California is pushing ahead on long duration energy storage, I think precisely because of this interest in finding some way to back down some of the gas that it, as, as was noted, is going to rely on for the foreseeable future, absent any technology substitute. Um, and that will also be significant in a lot of these places with winter reliability concerns. So I don't think we should count out the storage industry, even if we don't think lithium ion batteries are going to be the solution for a lot of that. So battery bubble, yes or no? <laughs> nope. Market by market. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, generally no, right? There, there is so much load growth. There's so much that's happening. Generally no. Uh, ERCOT? I'm, I'm yes. <laughs> Renee. I'll also say generally no. I think there's there's a lot of opportunity moving forward, but um might take a while in some of the other markets. All right, we gotta round it out here. Instead of asking for your predictions on, you know, where the industry is heading, do you have any battery hot takes that you can share here? Um as you frame where you think what what all this means and where we'll be in the next five to 10 years. I know Cody's probably got a, a dozen that he could rattle off here, but what, what's your favorite battery? <laughs> oh man. Uh, I, the one that is top of mind because of what Jason just said is about battery technology. So right now, um, you know, there, there is a bunch of other battery technology. We know it works that, um, is great energy storage technology. Pumped hydro works great. It's been around, you know, but nobody's building new dams. The the cost is prohibitive and nobody's letting you flood valleys anymore. That's just that's just not a thing that people are doing this century much. But all battery technologies have to compete with lithium ion batteries and have to beat it on cost handily. So far, there are um, some very interesting technologies really at lab and prototype scale, but nobody's actually shipping anything that is cheaper than lithium ion batteries, even before you start talking about the technical specs, right? Lithium ion also has those, most of those things beat hands down on round trip efficiency, footprint, everything else. Um, but for any non lithium technology to succeed, it, it's gonna have to be lithium ion hands down. And where we, you know, are building, Plants that are trying to do what pumped hydro does today, we're going to do them with lithium ion batteries until something beats it on cost. And it's going to be really, really hard. Um, I'm, I'm not holding my breath, although I wish all those technologists luck that are working on some of the, uh, the other interesting things out there. I, I love that you started that lightning round with alternative battery chemistries. That was the, that was the perfect way to kick it off. All right. As the engineer. Jason teed yeah. it up. <laughs> yeah. Blame him. <laughs> Jason and Renee. Uh, I'll do mine as, you know, I saw this interesting chart of the amount of storage in the queue. And I think we kind of touched on this earlier, but, you know, in some mark, most markets, it's at least 50%, if not 100% or more of, um, in terms of the gigawatts in the queue that would be able to meet the peak demand of the, each region. And so there is a tremendous amount out there. I think we're going to, um, obviously not all of it's going to get built, but we're going to see a lot more in the next 10 years. This is going to be a very different conversation. All right, Jason, the final word. Hot take. We're actually going to need more than we think we need. That has been the case literally for the entire history of the battery storage industry. And I'm going to get Cody looking skeptical at me, but we're actually going to need even more. Um, it just might not be the first owners of those batteries who get to profit from it. <laughs> so yes to a bubble. <laughs> I would say bubble driven growth is America's way. No, I mean, really, honestly, like we're going to see an enormous build out of an infrastructure that is going to provide 
incredible benefits to the U.S. power system and infrastructure for a couple of decades. And even if the individual companies might not win those bets, America is going to win that bet. So I'm all for <laughs> us building. Yeah, you, you tell. I've done trade association work before. Um, but really, honestly, I think that that's an incredible boon to the United States, that we are going to have these assets operating on the grid. That is at scale. And that's really exciting, even if each of our individual companies are looking at each other with competitive glare saying, I'm going to win, not you. Well, guys, I'm really glad that Renee committed all of you to doing another podcast in 10 years <laughs> to confirm any of these predictions and, and see if the bubble did, in fact, uh, form and burst. Uh, Cody, Jason, Renee, thanks so much for joining the podcast. This was a lot of fun. Thanks, John. Hey, thank you. Thanks for having us. Thanks again to Cody Hill, Renee Steichen, and Jason Berwin for joining the podcast. Factor This is a production of Renewable Energy World and Clarion Energy. Join us every Monday as we break down solar's biggest stories with industry leaders who actually move the needle. And please leave us a rating and review wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time on Factor This from Renewable Energy World. <laughs>